Each Saturday at the same time, the National Broadcasting Company presents Morgan Beatty's War Telescope, a review of the war week and a forecast of possible developments to come. Morgan Beatty is NBC's veteran war reporter in the British capital. And so for his regular Saturday report, we take you now to London. This is Morgan Beatty looking at the 196th week of war through the war telescope. And this is the week I've marked in my calendar as the week to tell you the story of censorship in Britain. Big events are just around the corner. Bold headlines are obviously in the making behind the scenes. The censor is the man who must put his seal on every one of our stories about the war before we can report the facts to you. Who is this man called censor? This man who sits across from me in my London studio this minute with his finger close to a button. A finger that can cut me off the air immediately, yet a finger that has almost never touched that button in four years of wartime censorship. How does he know what to cut out of the scripts of my broadcasts, if anything? How can a nation have censorship and still boast of democratic freedom of speech? What kind of news is barred and what can be reported? The other day I visited Admiral G.P. Thompson, Britain's chief censor. I told him I wanted to report to you folks back home to tell you frankly about British censorship. He said he thought it was a good idea. He and his men showed me all the wheels going round, and he gave me permission to tell you about these wheels and reveal facts about them never before brought out publicly. Admiral Thompson frankly admits that censorship in a democracy is an ugly thing. It is accepted in Britain only as an unfortunate necessity of war. The basic principle of censorship here and in the United States is the same. It's voluntary so far as news within Britain is concerned. But censorship is compulsory for news that goes out of Britain by mail, cable, or radio. And it's the same way at home, of course. The great volume of news dispatches that must be censored and the many precautions necessary to keep the enemy in the dark makes censorship a big business. There are some 155 regulations covering air raid news alone. This list of special instructions is known as the Air Raid Bible. Suppose, for example, that the siren had just sounded before I came into the studio tonight. I could tell you that London was under an alert. If the guns roared, the ak ak guns, I could say that. If bombs were dropped, I could tell you that. I could not tell you exactly what time the warning came, nor could I say whether any fires had been started. That's to prevent the enemy from discovering whether his planes were on schedule and whether they hit the targets they were supposed to hit. If I were to tell the exact position of a fire, incidentally, the enemy could snatch that information off the airwaves in time to tip the Luftwaffe that a big pathfinding fire was alight near London. But after daylight tomorrow, and the fire is out, I could make a more nearly complete report. Another example. Everybody knows that all belligerent air forces drop time bombs, but no broadcast or news dispatch from England has ever mentioned how the British deal with time bombs. The military authorities do not want the enemy to know how effective or ineffective his time bombs are. You might say that enemy spies probably dig up the information anyway, and that may well be true. But there's no point in handing the enemy information on a silver platter. Better that his spies run the gauntlet of Scotland Yard. They might get caught. British censors daily wade through dispatches in 62 different tongues. One censor alone speaks 25 languages. Those in the foreign language division all speak eight or more. Censorship is big business, too, because it's the little things that count. For example, the financial reports of all business organizations of any size are carefully censored. It would never do to reveal the balance sheets of certain public utility companies serving certain areas of Britain. Such companies have expanded their output of electric power tremendously, perhaps. That means new industries. Thus, the Germans would know where to look for new war industries. Censorship is a complicated business, too. For that reason, Admiral Thompson has organized it into nine separate departments. The largest of these is the Home News and Radio section. There, Commander M.L. Cox, retired of the Royal Navy, presides. The commander's job has been to improve the speed and fair play of censorship. He has an elaborate trolley system to move dispatches through the censorship mill. His dispatch index system reveals instantly the past rulings of censorship on any given subject or news story. And under this system, old worn out rulings are turned up and relaxed. The commander's genius for organization has reduced written complaints from the home press from scores a week in the early days to a very few per month now. But he tells a good story on himself. 
He thought he ought to get more speed in handling dispatches. So he offered to stand treat for beer for any censor under him who'd cut the time lag in handling home dispatches to an average of 15 minutes. I had to back down on that, says Commander Cox. In no time at all, I found myself rushing out to buy beer at all hours of the day and night. But there are seven other censorship departments. Photographic, movies, foreign languages, which I've already told you about, and technical. The technical department, by the way, handles scientific magazine, magazines and trade papers. In the last war, says Admiral Thompson, censorship was almost entirely military. Now that war is more nearly total than ever, we have to censor all kinds of information because all kinds of information have a vast potential value to the enemy. So technical papers and speeches are censored. Then there's the book and periodicals department and the scrutiny and correspondence section, which is a sort of a detective service on the lookout for violations of the code or the law, intentional or otherwise. The cable department is a big one and a key section. Before the war, the British government set up a shadow system of censorship, a blueprint for the substance if war should arrive. But the minute war broke out, the shadow system broke down under the strain. Outgoing cables piled up in a menacing cloud. On the very first day of the war, the censors fell about 24 hours behind. If that had kept up, they'd be a year behind the news right this minute. So a special cable department was set up with censors at the cable company offices. Today, the average news bulletin runs through censorship in about two minutes. For American broadcasters, the solution was personal censorship and innovation. In our studio, a censor is on duty 24 hours a day. He's sitting near me now with his hand in range of that cutoff button, the one he never uses. I count these personal censors my personal friends even though we sometimes have official disagreements. But I must admit that none of these disagreements has been vitally important. The Broadcasting Department of Censorship handles news set out by the BBC. Here we have the strange spectacle of a government censoring news which is put out by the British Radio, an organization known to be under heavy responsibilities to the government already. Thus, the BBC has no advantage over the rest of us broadcasters. And finally, there's the coordination section, the department that keeps the censors abreast of the news. When a big story is going to break, for example, the arrival of Prime Minister back in Britain today, the censor gets it a few moments ahead of the newsmen. If he didn't do that, he had never passed the dispatches reporting the Prime Minister's presence in Britain. What sort of a man is this censor? As a matter of fact, there are 200 of them acting as buffers between the press and the radio on one hand and the army, navy, and air forces on the other. They come from all walks of life. They're scientists, chemists, and the like for technical publications. They're former newspaper men and radio reporters. They're retired army and naval officers. One of them is a former director of a cable company. Another is one of the world's outstanding authorities on, of all things, salmon migration. And they tell me he's a pretty good censor, too. As a rule, the retired officers are not the best censors. They're occasionally too cautious. So far, we've covered only one kind of censorship. Security, information of value to the enemy. And there's very little important disagreement about this type of censorship. Take the trip of the Prime Minister just ended. A few days before the Roosevelt-Churchill meeting in Washington was officially revealed, a high government official told me, confidentially, that an important meeting would soon be held in Washington to work out long-range war strategy. So, when the Prime Minister failed to appear at his accustomed place in the House of Commons, I was fairly certain where he was and what he was doing. But I told nobody, and it was not necessary for me to be cautioned. When the official announcement came out of Washington, however, I had prepared myself in advance to report the reason why the Prime Minister was among you. And now we come to the really difficult part of the job, policy censorship, or as some of the correspondents say, political censorship. Something over a year ago, the government introduced policy censorship. It was after a series of dispatches had gone out of Britain indicating that British war production was not all that it should be, that there was too much drinking or pub crawling and things like that. Yet the production figures at that time showed Britain turning out more war products per man than any other nation in the world, including the, our own USA. The answer was policy censorship. The government put a dead stop on any dispatch or broadcast that could sow disharmony among the United Nations or between the Dominions and Britain. 
For example, for one brief period, nobody was allowed to link up on the air or in cables the British and American governments with the differences between de Gaulle and Giraud. The reason given was that the French political issue might generate ill will between Britain and America and bad blood, too, among Frenchmen. It was the same with the more recent Russo-Polish boundary dispute. At times, we've been barred from reporting any information about that dispute except official statements by the Russian and Polish government. Tonight, I asked Robert Bunnell of the Associated Press to tell us something about censorship. He's president of the American Correspondents Association, and he represents all of us radio and press correspondents here in London. Bob Bunnell, you know, has traveled the whole way with wartime censorship, including, of course, the Big Blitz. Bob, what about security censorship? Well, <clears throat> there have been instances where the Army or the Navy or the Air Force held up information too long, Morgan. But Admiral Thompson always goes to bat for the news and radio men. He knows that news from democratic nations must be trustworthy and fast. We have a reputation for honesty and speed in reporting. We cannot let ourselves down, nor can we afford to dilute the confidence of other nations in us. And uh, policy censorship? What about that? I think policy censorship is worse in principle than it is in practice. In other words, the uh, careful correspondent is penalized along with the careless reporter. I think, too, policy censorship is a tool of doubtful value. For example, if you cover up honest disagreement among the United Nations, when the news does break eventually, it may look a lot worse than it really is. But that's only my personal opinion. The administration of Admiral Thompson has been pretty nearly perfect. He's always been fair, so that even policy censorship in the end has not been intolerable. But another man could take a different attitude. Then it boils down to the same old story in democracy. It's the leadership that counts when the system's under a strain. Leadership here, as at home, has been foresighted enough not to censor criticism. You and I can report criticism of government from any source. But as one American to another, Bob, how would you sum up censorship over here? Well, uh, let's suppose that there's no censorship at all. Let's assume I am free at this moment to report any information I desire to the folks back home. In that case, I can truthfully say I would not report any really important news that has not already been reported through censorship. Then I guess we can conclude that it's your judgment that the correspondents over here, the American correspondents, are reporting as much as it's reasonably possible to disclose without helping the enemy. And Bob, that would be my impression too. As a matter of fact, I see one major defect in censorship, and it's a negative defect, a kind that doesn't appear quickly. The fact that there are so many stops on interesting news that would be a benefit to the enemy might tend to deaden the nose for news a reporter must develop. I'd like to explain that. You see, nowadays, every time you get an idea for a story, it's natural to jump at the conclusion that it'll be taboo in all probability and legitimately so because it would violate security censorship. And yet, a nose for news is important to democracy. In fact, enterprise in news is a foundation stone of democracy. Rapid, accurate transporting of essential facts cultivates a trustful atmosphere among nations. If we wartime reporters everywhere, from small towns in America to the tip of Scotland, can remember that, if we can never lose our nose for news, then we will have contributed no little to the victory of the United Nations. And now this is Morgan Beatty saying so long until next Saturday. You've been listening to War Telescope, a weekly report on the war as seen from London by Morgan Beatty, NBC's veteran war observer in the British capital. Mr. Beatty is presented every Saturday at this same time, so be sure to tune in again a week from now. The program came to you from New York and London. This is the National Broadcasting Company.